Welcome back to the Crooked Spine Show. This is Dr. Tony. I am a chiropractor in Upland. This is Lonnie Kim. She has Lonnie Kim coaching in, out of Claremont, but internationally and world known and probably maybe in the space. I'm not sure where she, she works. But she's had a growing business for a long time. She'll do a quick intro of, of her bio. So we had done, this is our second time showing. This is our second time, second show. Um, I want, I, I, when she talked to me about doing a second show, it's a great timing. People we had talked about off the show before we started today is people are trying to transition into how do I get into a job I want and or stay in the job I am, but now work around my hours. Maybe not do the two-hour commute every day. Maybe spend more time with them. Maybe make my house into a home or maybe a, a, a half office, or like I said, a co-op office down the street so I can work and be home at a certain time and spend time with my family and or with friends. We all want to support ourselves. We all want to support our families, but we don't want to burn out. How do we find the happy medium? Long before I was given some great ideas as a coach, how to find coaches and how to find coaches going to help you and give you ideas, what to actually get into your head to stay positive, stay motivated and stay on, on point what your goals are. Then we'll talk about is self-care. How do we, if we're, if we are now, we are in, in, this is July, 2021. Is it? Yeah, it is still, I don't know where I am. At that point, can we focus on where we are and where you are to get your mindset right? And, and hopefully not burn yourself out and live a healthy, happy life, not stress out by Lonnie Kim's, her her, talk, her topics for today. So Lonnie, take it over, good quick bio of what you have got into this. We'll get into your, into your topics. Okay. So I actually got into life coaching because I worked with a life coach and I totally fell in love with it. And I have um, a really long um, history in education and um I just wanted to start to share these tools like an educator would. Um, and I started off with working with a small group of people because that was more what I was comfortable with. And then it turned into one-on-one -on -one, um, sessions. And so that's how it all began. And I'm still here and <laughs> um, continuing the work and gosh, loving working with my clients. It's so exciting every day. I mean, everything, every day is something different and um, a new challenge for my clients as well as me. So it keeps me on my toes. And, you know, I think during this past year, definitely being on your toes is, is something that I think we actually look mm -hmm. forward to. It's just so much monotony. And um, so having a little excitement <laughs> was something I looked forward to. Um, so I really enjoy that aspect of the work, and in a challenge. Plus, you enjoy me. your work too. You you have fun with your work. That's that's the biggest mm -hmm, thing. You. you have fun mm -hmm. with it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And plus, yeah. you work from home too, for the most parts here mm -hmm. and there. And you mm -hmm. have how many? You have five kids at home? No, no. So it seems like given no, I just have three. <laughs> just three. Just three. Oh no. Just three. <laughs> that's, that's pretty. That's still a lot of kids. But well, my yeah. thing is, you learn to to not only teach this to your to your to your clients but also practice it also correct yeah yeah definitely um it's and that's i think the greatest thing about it is as a teacher we had to get these things called continuing education hours and sometimes they were helpful sometimes it was just something we marked off on our list but you know in self in life coaching um there is no <laughs> beating around a bush. There's no pretending. It's either I put in the work and I um, I show up as a great coach, or the alternative is that my clients don't get results, which definitely is not something I'm willing to compromise. So, no. you know, I love that. It keeps me on my toes and, and really pushes me to be the best me that I can be. So, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that, that not only do I get to work with wonderful people, it benefits me too. So that's great. Yeah, you, you have, when you have a passion for it, that's what it should be like. I think that's, that's the kind of something you can do long-term for the rest of your life. At that point, helping people should be something we all should do, but some people just aren't into it. So, cause you are congratulations and, and, and continue your success. That's the biggest thing. Let's get into your, your topics today. And what I'm going to do too, as, as I'm on my phone here, is I put some of the heading the headlines of, of the topics in the show notes. So you can see show notes later if you're in the show um, or even watch later too. So that's when you have topics, when they're when they're coming up and then when to actually watch them. So like, okay, so how do you want to start this? What do you think? 
Okay, so we can start off with a general sense of like, what is self-awareness? Why would I be interested in, in it yeah. in the first yeah. place? Is it something that just those self-help people <laughs> need or well, are interested in? Or is this something for myself? Um, yeah, so we can start there. And definitely I love the tie to physical activity and keeping physically yeah. healthy because people think so much about mindset and um, physical health, like almost separating the two of them when really mm -hmm. they work so hand in hand with each other. And when one is stronger, the other one can be so much stronger and it just builds off of one another. So um, that'd be a great place to start. And then um, we'll unpack it a little bit more as we go through. Good. Work your magic. Work okay. Your magic. <laughs> okay. So um, what's the general idea of self-awareness? It's just basically like a level of consciousness, cognition on how we see ourselves from different viewpoints. And in this case, um, I'm going to talk about what I call your self-concept. And it's got four components. Um, Self-esteem, self-efficacy, self integrity and self-confidence. Those are um, the four that I work around. Now you can Google it and they will give you, everyone has their own self-concept. People have written papers on it. Everyone's got a different opinion. Um, this is how I've cultivated my sense of the self-concept and how I work with my clients. Um, so one of the things I want to first point out is if you're watching this, and you know whether you're a creative or an analytical person, this really helps people understand at a very foundational way why they can or can't get things done. So if we watch uh, shows, movies, any type of media, we always see the perpetual um, artist who is messy, doesn't do things on time, kind of works on their whim, and then we see the analyticals, right? Type A, like I've got my checklist, I've got my timeline, and I just knock things out. Well, the reason is because creatives literally create from ground up. So whenever they're presented with something, they are literally starting it from ground zero. They're not taking anything into consideration, but what's in their own head. And that takes a lot of energy because they're starting from absolutely zero. So if you think of um, trying to jump and jumping to a certain height, we'll say two feet above maybe your fingertips. Well, they literally are starting on the ground trying to jump two feet in the air. Analytical people take what's around them and use that then to move forward. So you can think of that as the information around them is like little boxes and they're more than happy to step on those boxes so they can reach the height that they want to get to. So that gap between where they are and where they want to achieve is a lot smaller than a creative who's like, okay, I'm starting ground zero. I have to jump two feet in the air. That's a lot of work. And I just don't feel like it right now. I just don't have the energy, right? So they almost have to like find their creative energy and build it up. Mm. And the reason I bring this up is because that's going to be your patience. <laughs> There's, mm -hmm. They're going to be analytical or creatives. And if they're having difficulty with finding regular um, time for their physical health, you know, maybe some exercises that you've given them. If they're creative, they're probably yeah. trying to rethink everything you told them <laughs> and trying to think of like some other fantastical creative way to do it. And so in their minds, it's this huge gap, you know, whereas maybe a more analytical person would just say, hey, Dr. Tony gave me these five exercises. He told me it's going to take 10 minutes. That's it. I'm done. I have a done. 15 minute break every afternoon. I'm just going to knock it out. Right. Mm -hmm. Creative is like, OK, what time of day does do I really have to do the exercises in that order? I'm like, I'm like, I'm like pain, right yeah. now, look, 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 look at me. Look at me. It's just painful. <laughs> this is called painful questions. So 
that is the way that creatives think. So if you get a patient who seems creative mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I'm sure you heard that term non-compliant, right? The non-compliant yeah. patient. Um, it'd be interesting if you were to observe if your non-compliance are also your creative people and it's not out of... I'll tell you yes. Yes, right now, yes. <laughs> okay. And it's not because it's a conscious choice. It's just that's how their brains work. Mm -hmm. So if you find you're creative and you find it, um, you're not getting the results you want, not achieving what you want, you have a, maybe a lot of um, hesitation and avoidance. Mm -hmm. Just understand that about yourself. Um, and when we go into the self-concept, um, you can kind of pinpoint where your, ener your low points of energy are and where your strong points of energy are so you can make it all work for you. Um, so I wanted to, to talk about that because I actually was chatting with my daughter about it because she's a creative and um, analytical. And so when I talk to her, I have to keep that in mind because I just get it. To me, you just get it done. Like, that's how I think. It's here's my list. I just get it done. It's and not that hard, Lonnie. Just do right. it. <laughs> exactly. But, and a lot of this you're, you're saying is because when you go through these topics of the self-awareness topics it is preceding them from a creative person and an analytical person, correct? Right, right. Good, and good, overall, good, like, yeah, and then even wanting to work in these areas, you know, if because at the end of this, if you're a creative person, at the end of the this viewing, you're going to try and rework it the way you want to rework it instead of working with the information that you've been given. And that does seem very overwhelming. So just be aware of that. Um and once you're aware of it, you can start to think, okay, am I just expending way too much energy in this area? Is it worth it? You know, or could I use my creative energy in actually creating something that I wanted to create rather than trying to reinvent the wheel of something that really doesn't need to be invented? No. Um, so being creative is not bad, correct? It's just being a different way of thought, it's a different way mm -hmm. of getting things done. Okay. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, and once creatives get into that mindset, and that's why, um, you know, you hear of artists who work like through the night or crazy hours or they're just gone for a week because it took them so much energy to get into that creative space that they they know that they have to use that, that momentum to keep on going because to get that, okay. to live a nine to five lifestyle, it's almost overwhelming to think okay how do i find enough energy to be good at nine o'clock to work all the way to five o'clock turn it off and then find the energy again to be ready to do it tomorrow morning they yeah. don't want work that way they just want to get it done <laughs> because they've mm -hmm. got the momentum and they don't want to stop it you know it's like rolling a rock up a hill a stone you wouldn't want to stop in the middle right you just want to get it to the top and then just be done with it and so that's the way creatives work which I mean, you see their genius when they're done, but to get there was just so much more energy than an analytical person. But of course the outcomes are different too, right? Analytical people yeah. typically stop where you tell them to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're like, okay, 10 reps, Dr. Tony, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with done. the 10 reps. A creative is gonna be like, hmm, well, I don't know. What would 20 reps be like or 15? Mm. Or You know, they just have a different, way of looking at things and they may i don't know change the order of things or how often they do things and um they may actually do more than an analytical person at the end of the day but it's just where does their energy come from and how much energy does it take to get into that that mental space to be able to carry out you know like some physical exercises sure. um so yeah i just thought that would be i mean that's just an applicable idea to all people and especially your patients. If well, not having... to some people, I, I consider people, some be, people being morning people, some being, being with night owls. So for mm -hmm. me, it's, it's, it's not if someone, for example, the exercise, the exercise example is I go, when do you feel comfortable doing exercises? When, when's your, what, when's good for you? Mm -hmm. And when's, when do you do it now? Right. What's your routine now? Like when, when's your, when's a good time that you normally find as, as a way to only exercise, but how to exercise and what do you like to do? So for me, going from analytical, being being an, an analytical person myself, is how do I think creatively in a sense where making those questions 
more around a creative of what works for you, how to done in the past, and how can we do it in the future to now add something in here differently to make sure it's going to benefit your overall health when you're ready, when your body feels ready for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, work. yeah. yeah. It's, it's not my normal mindset. Mine is like, hey, you said, like, hey, we're in the morning when you get up, do this. At lunchtime, do this. At dinner time, let's do this, and then you'll be good to go. Boom. Right. I'll see you in the morning. That's it. Right, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I and I definitely understand that mindset too, because that's very much how how I look at things. But um, but well, it is I, I use less words, right? That's my biggest thing. I use less words. I less ask less questions, and because someone sometimes is not like me, okay, how do how do I back up and go? How do I be like them, and how they're thinking versus wanting them to come like me? That's gonna be too hard. It's gonna be them going up a harder hill versus me coming down to their not their level but their mindset mm -hmm. and now matching their mindset. So like attracts like to make them understand how I want to get things done. I don't care when you get it done. It's got to get mm -hmm. it done. So your overall results, your result is either better or better than my expectation, or at least at my expectation. So your body, so your, so your health improves. Right. Right. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's what I usually go for. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Cause that's, um, not always the service that you get, especially yeah. in the healthcare field where people tend to be analytical. <laughs> it's very much what? like a one no size fits all so often. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, okay, so the next thing I wanted to kind of transition, but it's still related to this creative versus analyticals and um, is your primitive brain versus your prefrontal cortex. And I know that we had gone over it, but um, I wanted to explain it maybe more in a way that creatives could understand rather than the way I <laughs> tend to be very um, short and analytical in the way I use, and I use my like, you know, vocabulary, but I wanted to create a picture instead. Good. So, um, because when creatives are not they're they're the most scared in their primitive brain and that's really why it takes so much energy for them to get out mm -hmm. of it um versus analyticals because they tend to live a little bit more in their uh, logic space they don't they're not as as susceptible as other as creatives to their primitive brain like kind of being the loudest voice in their head so the way I look at it is you are walking down a path and you come to a fork in the road and you have two options. You can take a, um, a drag race car or you can drive a minivan. And your drag racing car is like your primitive brain and the minivan is like your prefrontal cortex. So if you think of a drag race car, it is meant to be super fast, quick off the, the start. It's mm -hmm. only meant to go straight and fast. And that is it. It is not like a, it's not even like the indie cars that go in a circle. It's just straight, straight and fast. That's it. Okay. <laughs> and they're not built the most um, durable. They're just meant to go from A to B straight. And that's really how your primitive brain is. It's quick off the start and it's meant to just get to wherever very quickly, efficiently. It's not very strong. It's very susceptible to any bumps in the road or if it were to have to swerve, it would probably flip over. A primitive brain is very, very much like that. Very derailed very easily. Yeah. And when we stay in our primitive brain and we are derailed, then we go into fight or flight and fear. So on the other side is the minivan option, right? So not very quick, <laughs> but it's got lots of accessories. It's got lots of features. It's very flexible. You can either pack a soccer team in it or you could fold it down and put like couches and chairs in there. Um, you can, you know, they have plugins. You can practically camp in your, in your minivan and so it just has a lot of flexibility and you can use it in very creative ways, but it's much slower off the start. And so I bring that up because if we can give ourselves a pause so that 
that initial reaction of our primitive brain to be the fastest, if we could just give ourselves a couple of seconds to allow ourselves to hop into the minivan, <laughs> then we can enter a creative mode and we're not just going to that straight and fast um, mode where you know we're easily derailed and we're just at efficiency regardless of the results. We just want efficiency and safety, that's it. Um, so I wanted to offer that because um, that is where I work with a lot of my clients primarily, really how to shift that um, from primitive to prefrontal cortex, your creative, your solutions, uh, your creative area of your brain, your solution um, center and your um, logic center. What, um, what's an example of someone that would be going through, so it would be more of a say, personal professional, I guess, struggle or concern or something you want to get through that would help with that situation. How would you, how would you use an example of that? Okay. So one of them is with, you know, like you were mentioning, um, just with things, well, kind of opening up, right? <laughs> Opened up for a little bit and people being really reflective, um, on kind of the past year and what that's meant for them is I have a good handful of clients that now that they were kind of scrambling to look for a side job, not always because they had to, but a little bit of fear because they were in industries that were kind of threatened by everything that happened this year. They looked for creative outlets to make some extra income. Well, a lot of them have found that that's what they want to do. And so sure. now they are trying to make the choice because, um, you know, I have several in the um, food and restaurant industry. And so now they're needing people and they're needing people on a very regular basis. But then these people are conflicted because they had been able to spend so much time on their side business because they weren't working as much. And now they're presented with this issue. Like, what, what do I want to do? Always um, the time of the day, yeah. Yeah. Now, do I go back to my full time job as a, <laughs> say, cook and restaurant, or do I start something else on the side that I like to do? Right. Right. Got it. Got it. Got yeah. It. And so, um, very much they're, you know, working through this because their primitive brain is obviously saying, well, why would you want to create a business out of nothing and have to support yourself? And, you know, now you have to provide insurance for yourself, you have to provide, you know, clients um, for yourself, or maybe they're making products. I mean, that is just so overwhelming. It could easily be overwhelming, I should say, to some people. And that really starts to activate your primitive brain. Whereas the job that you've done, maybe for several years or decades, yeah. that's on autopilot, practically. Why not do that? That's just easier. And a lot of them see the safety in that, even though truthfully this past year, I think, you know, uh, revealed to them, maybe it's not such a safe industry, but you know, there is still this part of the primitive brain that's like, oh, but it's safe. And someone pays you your salary and you don't Is it have safe to or is it comfortable? Because you know, you're getting to show up every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that what it is? Yes, yeah, comfort. No. And the way we interpret comfort is a sense of safety, like, because there's no discomfort, right? So it's yeah. more avoiding discomfort, if you want to think yeah. about it that way, because then discomfort really puts us into that um, fight or flight, high alert kind of um, state of mind and body. <laughs> I mean, that, right? That's why I'm sure, I mean, you must have a great deal of patients that come to you strictly out of stress. It may manifest as one symptom, right? But really underneath it, it's the stress that has taken its toll over the time, the years that now shows up as this other maybe diagnosis, but really it started with the stress. Well, that's, that's, and that's exactly what sometimes people come in, especially now, um, I become more, if you want to call it questioning when someone has chronic pain, uh, what's mm -hmm. going on? And, and what has a chronic pain, either what is the source of, what's the onset, what may have caused it, um, or also what has, how's it affected you? Has a chronic pain become gone from a stress to an anxiety, from an anxiety to a depression? Has it, mm -hmm. has it shifted 
throughout you and your body and people around you to affect your ability to be comfortable, affect your ability to do things you want to do versus things you have to do. Mm-hmm. So my thing is, how do we how do we get people? How do I understand where their stress coming from? Sometimes I can help with their back pain, but their stress is well, really I don't like my job or. Mm-hmm. I, I'm upset about this and I, I can't get away from this or I have this long drive for work, but I'm not, I, I don't feel like that's part of what I want to do. I go, mm-hmm. okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm never going to tell someone to quit their job, leave their family, kick the dog out of the house. I'm going to say, okay, how do we deal with where you are? Mm-hmm. Make your stress levels drop down so that it's manageable. Now find different alternatives to get yourself toward a better state. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because once you're stressed, your body's more sensitive to pain sensitive mm-hmm. to your overall things in your body. So at that point, you're not feeling what you should be feeling, so your perception is going to be off from the nervous perspective, from the nervous system perspective, from your body's perspective. Yeah. Yeah, that's so interesting. I never thought about that. Like, you're just kind of in that heightened state of, like, feeling your body, and so a lot more sensitive to... You know, it's that fight and flight all, all the time, so your body mm-hmm. starts shutting down to where this becomes your normal state. Yeah. You normally act out. You normally are grouchy. You normally are. That's your normal state at that point. <laughs> you have to almost break that to go, hey, I, now I know where I am. I'm aware of this. How do I get myself to a healthier state? How do I get mm-hmm. myself to where, how do I ask myself the right question that that's where I am to get myself out of this? And that point, get, without the right questions, you can't find the right answers. Right. So having someone like yourself wanting to talk to or my, myself at a very minimal level to get the right questions to give you the right answers, so long term, even though it may not feel good to do the right thing, over time will change your nervous system, change sensitivity to more about more of a realistic perspective of of you of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and that is such the interesting intersection of physical and mental when it really becomes that manifestation in your physical body. And then opposite, going through the mental discomfort, discomfort to change your physical body for mm-hmm. the better, you know. Um, yeah, so that's definitely uh, the great scope of my work because, I mean, daily we live in that, right? I mean, even getting up in the morning, <laughs> you're already combating your primitive brain and your prefrontal cortex if you haven't got a good night's sleep. You're already at a deficit. You're you're your primitive brain is already like, no, I need sleep. I need rest. And your prefrontal cortex is saying, nope, you've got to get out of bed because there are so many other things that we have to do. And so this, this, um, so it starts, it's a war, right? And I'm not saying that it's never a war or it's always a, um, a truce created through life coaching, but it's really understanding how to marry the two together. So they, for the most part, are working together, especially in the most important areas of your life, and they're not battling each other, um, so that you can make decisions for yourself and not sit there and like, oh, do I do I get out of bed? <laughs> do I go back to sleep? <laughs> do I do I get out of bed? Do I go to sleep? You know. So when you really understand the underlying um, thoughts behind that, and you learn to make decisions instead of wondering, you just wake up in the morning and you make that decision. Like I'm getting out of bed because, and whatever the mindset work that you've done, that thought comes to you. Um, it almost becomes like it almost becomes okay. I already know what the situation is like. I've done this yesterday, the last few weeks or so. I know what I have to do. So you're giving someone the 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 play by play how how you how you can respond to this without having to think about it. You're not having to have the debate between between your prefrontal cortex and primitive brain. The debate's already been solved. We solved this yesterday. Mm-hmm. It's already signed. It's already signed document. We're good to go. We agreed mm-hmm. to this. So exactly. there's, there's no there's no waiting time. There's no because like I said, like you were saying, once you start asking questions or asking, do we get out of bed? Do we stay in bed? It become it almost causes more anxiety because mm-hmm. now you don't have an answer. There's no solution. You're just every day you're doing this. That just that sounds painful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you're going and there's so, so much many... energy just trying to get out of bed. You're wasting so much energy, <laughs> in my sense, just to, yeah. try to try to try to take those two that that rise. And then turn and then put your feet on the ground. It doesn't seem that hard. Yeah. One, but once you've gone through that, one, but once you're in that state of debate all the time, it becomes like you said, 
it, it almost becomes a, a brick wall you have to get over to make sure you take the next step. And that, so that whole day becomes more of a process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. And that's why, you know, when people say plan out your day ahead, it's not mm -hmm. solely because you just want to check off. I mean, I'm sure someone analytical came up with that idea, but it's not just. I, I, I signed that one. I signed that one. That was me. <laughs> right. But it's also because you really are priming your brain on what to expect the next day mm -hmm. and already make that choice. So it's not even per se a choice. It's just a thing that you do. I get up in the morning. It's not like, do I get up or not get up? It's like, I get up in the morning. Not, it's not mm -hmm. even an issue. It's just kind of like when you eat, you don't think, oh, I need to take my fork and lift my food to my mouth. It's just this automatic mm -hmm. thing to do because we know how to do it. And that's a decision we've made to eat with a fork. Um, so very much that, you know, that debate. So for your patients, it might look like, do I do my exercises today or do I not do my exercises today? Yeah. You have to head and you've set aside that time, then it's not even a debate. It's just, this is what I do at my lunch break. Um, so, so, having, so having like a routine then basically allows the weight, your body to not stress, not I'll say stress about it, but not have the debate if we have a routine lined up every day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it can change, you know, I mean, I, I never want to say you have to do the same thing every day, but yeah. have it planned ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you have any sense of, um, um, not scarcity, but um, limited resources. So for instance, if you have a break and it's 15 minutes, you feel like it's a limited resource because technically it is, is you've got 15 minutes. And so your primitive brain is already in mode. It's like, you've got 15 minutes. That's it. What are you going to do with it? So that's not a good time to decide no. whether you want to do Dr. Tony's exercises or not. Cause your brain's like, no way. Like I have limited time. I'm fight or flight. Like I want to go grab something out of the vending machine and scarf it down. Like that's my priority right now because your primitive brain is talking to you at that point. But if you make the decision ahead of time, I mean, even in the morning is totally fine. It's just as long as it's ahead of time and you're not making it, you know, at a time where your primitive brain is, is really, you know, um, speaking loudly to you. So if you're the type to wake up drowsy, yeah, not, not a good time to plan your, <laughs> plan your day. You should have planned it the day before. But if you're yeah. the type that wakes up in the morning and they're like, I wake up at 5.45 and I'm on fire. Yeah, you could plan your day at 5.45 in the morning if you're that type of person and then just say, okay, at my break, I'm going to set aside some time or um, you know, whatever it is. Like, um, So one of my clients, one of the things we had to work on is this had to do with food but she really used her time after coming home because no one knows exactly when you come home, right? So she actually did some of her pre-planning in her car before she actually stepped in the house and then everyone greeted her and all the busyness and then, you know, that, that fight or flight response that some people initially have when they walk in and there's just like, you know, kids needing you, a husband asking you when dinner is ready and, you know, things like that. And so instead she, you know, stayed in her car for a couple more minutes, did some of her mindset work before she walked in the house. So she wasn't like grabbing chips and everything um, because, you know, she was just stressed out at that point. So whatever needs to be done, you know, and if, and if it's like, okay, either maybe I clock out at five and right before I actually go home, I do my exercises or um, there's a park right next to my house. So before I actually go home, I'm actually going to stop at the park, do my exercises and then drive, you know, the two and a half blocks more, um, to get home, whatever it might look for you, look like for you, just as long as you're not in your primitive brain trying to make that, that decision. Um, but it's also, it's give yourself that space to go, Hey, how do I plan this out? So I'm in my space. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost like, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I can go home. And while I'm making dinner, the kids are yelling at me. Or want to play with me? I can do my exercises. Probably not. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but it's, no. gonna, it's gonna happen though. It, it's almost. Mm -hmm. And some people have to go through that trial and error of what's gonna work for them. So oh, today exactly. may work after five o'clock. Yes, I can. I can do that after work at the park. But tomorrow at five o'clock, I have. I take my my daughter or son to a dental appointment, 
at 5.30, so I have to get home right away. So maybe I can do it afterwards, or maybe I should plan it at a different time. So mm -hmm. again, every day is going to be different, like you had mentioned. Everything, every day is going to be different, like you had mentioned. How do we plan for that next day if we can, if things don't, don't the wrench isn't thrown in the system, to at mm -hmm. that point get our body and our mind to relax and not feel stressed because we're just spontaneously reacting to everything all day long. We're, we're react reactionary versus planning things up. Does that mm -hmm. kind of kind of the same mm -hmm. concept? Yeah, Good. definitely. Good. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's, I mean, really the the power of self-awareness. Um, and then we can definitely get into like those aspects of your self-concept, which I love this because I think it's stuff that we know about ourselves but we're not mm -hmm. able to define it and when we can't define it when there's any kind of confusion we're not able to take action and so yeah. Yeah. um i love this because it really is a way to speak to people in very intuitive ways but because it hasn't been defined for them they're not able to i call it like up level their sense of awareness but it's such sim such simple information that once you hear it, you're like, oh, okay. Like I can totally take action like today to do something because I intuitively understand a lot of this stuff. I just didn't understand how maybe it was playing into my life. Um, so, um, okay. So the self-concept is, like I said, the self-efficacy, self-integrity, self-confidence, and self-esteem. Um, so <laughs> self-efficacy is one of the ones that people are like, what? That's the one that most people are like, I don't, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, so that's the one I'll, I'll address first. Um, so it is basically, um, your belief in your ability to succeed. So it has a lot to do with belief. Um, in terms of what that looks like in action, it is understanding the process to go through to create the results that you're looking for. So that'll come. Mm -hmm. And so the way we view this in others um, would be like resilience to adversity and stress. Um, do they have healthy a healthy lifestyle and habits? Um, do they have notable educational achievements? So that's how we would see someone with high self-efficacy, like as an observer. Um, and how this affects us, like our own sense of self-efficacy, is it affects our motivation, our sense of well-being, and our sense of personal accomplishment. Um, and so the easiest way I present it is to present like a strong sense and a weaker sense of self-efficacy because it's such a new word for some people like a picture is a lot easier for them to grasp onto other than words so i would say a person with strong self-efficacy would be like someone who develops an interest in the activities that they already that they're in into um or they participate in and sometimes they don't even always love whatever that activity is um maybe they have to do it for some reason or they feel obligated yeah. to do it for some reason but because they have such a sense of high self-efficacy and the ability to succeed in it, they just naturally want to do well in it. And so they take a lot of interest in whatever that is and understanding whatever activity that is. Um, they therefore have a strong sense of commitment to whatever it is that they're doing. And um, what they're trying to do is master whatever that challenge mm -hmm. is. So those people who are always doing crazy things because just because <laughs> they're like, oh, it just feels good to figure this out. I just love these challenges. They have a high sense of self-efficacy. Now, for those people who may struggle with their sense of self-efficacy, it would look like avoiding challenges completely um, and focusing on personal negative experiences to talk yourself out of whatever you're being presented with, whatever opportunity you've been presented with, or maybe whatever situation you're already currently in. You're really focusing on that negative self um, talk and, and really 
using your past experience, negative experiences to avoid um, participating in something. Um, and then these are the people who jump activities as soon as they feel challenged. Um, they're just like, oh, this is too hard, next. <laughs> so that's what it would look like for people who have a weaker sense of self-efficacy. And so um, for this, because it affects belief, I mean, that's mm -hmm. such an essential part of us getting stuff done. And mm -hmm. so this is a really important component of your um, self-concept. So one of the things, one of the questions would be then, like, well, what do I do if I have a weaker sense of self-efficacy? It's great if I have a higher sense of self-efficacy. I'm already there, good, done. Sense of efficacy. What does that yeah. look like for me, right? Um, so I would say observe people who are similar to you that you feel a connection with, but they're overcoming the challenge that you are overcoming. And that's why mentorship, which I know you love and have a passion for, is so important because typically mentors have some kind of draw to each other, right? They're mentor and mentee. Mm -hmm. There's some kind of draw between the two of them. And then being able to see your mentor who is somewhat similar to you achieve and overcome obstacles helps your sense of self-efficacy. Because again, that's about believing that it can be done. And um, so that's why- because, For example, a mentor would give someone a case where you are, that we know we know we, we want to get over this this challenge, but then I, but I can see because I've been there before, let's break it down to small challenges here and there for you to make that big challenge easier for you step by step. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 Um, and then um, I think that's why we have such this love of reality shows, <laughs> you know, because we get yeah. to see people who maybe aren't even like us, maybe they're a little exaggerated version of ourselves, but yeah. you know, that humanness that we see and the fact that they are able to overcome challenges despite that, you know, human tendency to, I don't know, be lazy or not do things or think negatively, all of that, right? So um, that's why when we see the really dramatic shows and we're like, why do people watch this junk? It's because they see these people who, most people have a very negative opinion of, yet they're making, you know, yet they're successful or well known or have some kind of status. And that, as silly as it sounds, for those with low self efficacy, gives them a sense of like hope in the fact that maybe they could do it too. Um, so those silly shows might actually help people. <laughs> people with low self efficacy. But you're not talking about like The Bachelor or Bachelorette, right? Right? No, those shows? Not those shows, but like. Um, okay, I'll make sure because those shows just, those are hilarious to me because they're, I just, I do the opposite. Like, I think it's just hilarious. Right, right, right. I, I'm thinking more of like. Um, Weight loss like challenge. Keeping up with the Kardashians. <laughs> Which I, I mean, you know, the, everyone puts them on memes and makes fun yeah. of them, but they're highly, in the monetary sense, highly successful. So, you know, for people who are knocking them, it's almost like, if they can do it, I can definitely do it. You know, yeah. that's- kind yeah, of yeah, like I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. If you have something <laughs> you want to do and, and it helps you get to that point where you feel you're, 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 you've accomplished something, why not? Yeah. You know, this, so, is, this is still America. It's not- communist russia or north korea because <laughs> exactly. we can do whatever we want to do and exactly. it's not going to hurt somebody that point make what you want to make be successful mm -hmm. the way you want to be successful yeah. Else, nothing yeah good and that's why you know a lot of those shows like um i think of um like master chef these everyday mm -hmm. cooks and then mm -hmm. they become these wildly successful celebrity chefs mm -hmm. or um uh, I can't think of the name of a specific one, but those kinds of races where, you know, it's just everyday people and they're trying to do these physical challenges. It's so inspiring to us because we're thinking like, wow. So that, you know, six foot, 150 pound guy who's wet, maybe he's 150 pounds, like overcame these wildly crazy physical challenges. Like I could do that too. So that practice for people who have low 
self-efficacy could actually really be helpful to them. <laughs> if you're not watching it like you just for pure entertainment. <laughs> Pure entertainment, that's all it is. Like the host is like, the host is fake crying. I'm like, I know you're fake crying. I can see it right there. Come on, put some like eye drops something on your eyes. I don't know. Right, right. But, that, like talking about, but can you also, besides reality shows, can you find mentors, for example, say audio books or things that are self motivating, or like you said, mentor with a coach, something like that, to a mentor to find things, even online on YouTube, um, mm -hmm. like just normal classic books that, that put an audio or even read a book, how to get yourself to a better state, how this is someone, for example, if you want to go into stocks and bonds, how Warren Buffett did it. You know, if you want to talk, if you want to be in politics, how this person is. So you have these biographies from successful people that would even read them or watch them or listen to them to get that knowledge, that next step that may help you feel oh, that that's my trigger. Now, but now I can get there. Like you said, you're, you're trying to give someone a step up in the right direction so they have the motivation to get to do what they want to do. Right. And so I'm glad you brought that up because that's why biographies are so powerful for people mm -hmm. because, you know, I have read a lot of books and sometimes they're books that are just about theories, which is great. But if you have low self-efficacy, that's really not always helpful. But biographies yeah. are so powerful because typically they're about the everyday person and their challenges, how they overcame that challenge and the results. And people with low self-efficacy really don't understand that process. And so the more they read through how, what the process looked like for you know all these different people who we call successful, that really helps them understand that the process is doable, that there is a process. And, and it's part of the process. So this was actually tying into the other thing I was going to say to increase your sense of self-efficacy is collecting evidence um, okay. that will help you know that that result is possible. So um, encouragement definitely helps, you know, so, you know, having kids, you know, when, you, when they're little and they're trying to walk and crawl and, you know, they're falling and you're just cheering them on regardless of the fact that they fall more than they get up, right? You still encourage them and it's just still so exciting. And that's really helping their sense of self-efficacy. And so people who have low self-efficacy, you know, doing that, um, reading these types of books where you really understand that process. And then um, also um, looking back to people really underutilize using past experiences. And the reason we do that is because usually it's we're in a negative state of mind. And so we already created a filter of not wanting to see that something is doable. Even though if we really look through our lives and we look and collect evidence that we're able to do something, there's lots and lots of evidence. We just don't take the time to go back and look at it, right? So for the athlete who maybe didn't qualify for the Olympics this year, does that mean they're a failure? They might feel like it, right? But for the majority of us, we think, wait a minute, you just broke some records. You just won some medals. You just did some amazing things. And in your head, you've labeled yourself as a failure. In my head, that's amazing, right? So they just lack that practice of going back and saying, oh, I am able to do this. And I just need to understand the process. And if they, you know, maybe want to qualify for the next Olympics. Okay, how do we, re how do we take that process and recreate it so that I'm increasing my strength, my speed, whatever it might be, so that I do qualify for the next, you know, Olympics. Um, I think really it was, I was John Wooden or, or maybe a, a football coach who said he learned more from his losses than his wins. Yeah. So how do you, how do you, like you said, how do I go? Hey, if, if I lost today, if it whatever sport or event or maybe even a, a say a, a bid for a big job somewhere at that point, what can I do to make myself better internally or even mentally too, or physically to get the next one and get the next one that I'm always, I'm always the under underdog guy cheering them on because he or she may not win that day, but okay. See him next time. And next time, if, if they get this right, if they figure out what it was that their weakness, whatever it was, gets that right. 
boom, they're going to step over that that person that beat them today. We're going to beat them by a, by a mile next time. Yeah, yeah. So definitely looking back at like what mm-hmm. what were the times where you were successful? What were the times that you um, were able to create the result you were looking for? And it's okay if it's in small steps because really, if you take those small steps and you keep replicating them you're going to get to where you want to be. It just may not be on the timeline of somebody else. It's going to be on your timeline. And so, you know, that really has to do with a lot with the, with the self-efficacy thinking that, am I going to make it through this? You know, am I going to be able to sustain this? Like, so for instance, if you have, you're on a team and someone um, like a runner is able to, run, I don't know, 100 meter dash and shave off two seconds off his time. It may only take him six weeks to get that strong and and be able to run two seconds faster. For you, it may be eight to 10 weeks. It's just going to be different. You can hit it. It just may not look exactly like, you know, your teammate. But getting through that process of comparison, because that's often what we do. We think the reality is the comparison when it's like, that's not the comparison. If that person was not next to you, you you wouldn't think that, right? You would just keep going through your process. And even if it took you 10 weeks, you would still get there. The only thing that makes you feel at this moment, like it's not possible is because you just compared yourself to somebody else. So um, that has a lot to do with self-efficacy because people with high self-efficacy aren't worried about the people around them. They just know well, they could get it done and they believe it. So they get it done. Well, and a lot of it is by having a coach that, that supports you and, and knows who you are. And then they'll understand when you start having negative talk. Okay. Well, well let's stop saying negative talk. Let's go back when it did work. Let's, let's go watch this video over here. Or yeah, you were off today because you did this, 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 and you can't see yourself run. So that mm-hmm. one, let me, cause I'm your coach. Let me see exactly how we can improve maybe your start or your finish, or your gate, whatever it might be in the run, at that point, let's figure out this self-talk you're doing right now to get that out of your head and find out why. Mm-hmm. But we realize, even if someone has high self-efficacy in their Hussein Bolt, they've probably been beaten once or twice in their life, mm-hmm. and they're going to go, they're not going to go, well, I'm Hussein Bolt, I'm done. I've been beat. I'm done. <laughs> right. Call it a day. No Olympics for me. Right. I'm going home. Going back to Jamaica, I'm going to go, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to go, okay, I've done this before. And, and, and again, it's because he's him or other athletes too. They've had a loss here and there at that mm-hmm. point. They're going to understand, okay, I've been here before. I've had a loss. How to get out of last time? How do I refocus? Mm-hmm. How to figure out what I did? What can I do? Maybe even get a different coach, whatever it is. That's not helping me now to find a different way to look at this problem. Mm-hmm. Definitely. No. Yeah. Yeah. And that's definitely like when I say life coach, it is very much like that. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, for football players, I, I mean, I think of this classically how they have those days, um, usually maybe the following Monday where they're all sitting in the stinky locker room and they're playing the reels, right, of the game. And the coach Got is going, 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 yeah, they're trying to, trying to keep it in place. <laughs> right, right. Um, or sometimes they're watching the reels for the team they're about to play, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's very much what a coach will do. It they're going to collect all the, I mean, it's the mental uh, video, I mean, or mental reel, not not a video reel, and then start to look at it from an outside view and not you who's got like, you know, this view where you're right in the midst oh. of it and not able to see anything else around you. So that is very much how um, a coach can bring that light into you know, your perspective and increase your perspective on on yourself. Um, So that's definitely one one component, self-efficacy. The second component is self-integrity, which simply means your actions align with your beliefs. Um, And people tend to downplay the sense of self-integrity on how People see it very much a lot of times from a moralistic point of view, but this really has, even if you are not into morals, this actually has like a real world practical application. And here's why. Um, It really has to do with follow through and, you know, to do things you need to follow through. So um, regardless of, you know, that, that aspect, whether you have like a moralistic or 
spiritual aspect, it comes down to a very practical aspect too. So I would say the words we use to describe people with high self-integrity would be they're trustworthy, they're responsible, they're reliable. Um, and opposite, when we see someone who displays um, low self-integrity, in, um, a lot of times people use phrases to talk to them. These phrases like, um, be honest with yourself, or accept your limitations, or... Um, follow through with your word. Like that's a lot of times if if you hear that a lot, <laughs> you might want to assess your level of self-integrity because um, the the power of self-integrity is just not obviously our, can people rely on you, but self-integrity also affects your sense of self-confidence. So it's, an awesome tool because if you have low self-confidence, you can actually increase your self-integrity and increase your self-confidence. And self-integrity tends to be more of a process, like a very, um, a very um, tangible process, right? So if I say uh, for us, right? <laughs> yes, let's do the episode. If I show up, right? That's that's increasing my self-integrity. If I don't show up, that's decreasing my self-integrity. Yeah. Or, you know, for the patients who make appointments with you, do you show up to your appointment? Do you do the exercises that Dr. Tony gives you? If, you know, if he says, hey, can you do these exercises? And you say yes, right? So you have control over that. It's very tangible. It's very action-oriented. Um, and like I said, the benefit of that is that can actually increase your self-confidence, which is one of the two areas that I would say people struggle with the most, self-confidence and self-esteem, because they seem very intangible. Like you either have it or you don't. Most people really, really feel like it. Um, so I'm going to actually transition into self-confidence because it kind of plays off of this whole self-integrity. Um, so self-confidence is like your ability to perform a goal or task. It has to do with your ability um, and not so much always your belief, um, which is people tend to tend to confuse them. So this could be described as your strength in your ability to perform something. Um, but here is the interesting about self-confidence that I think was really surprising to me is it works for you or against you. You can actually have such great belief in your ability to perform something that it can be in a negative manner too. Um, so I had a friend tell me, she's like, oh, that's so interesting. She's like, I have a really high sense of self-confidence. And she said, in fact, I'm so confident that I'm not a good cook. She's like, I don't cook. <laughs> And so she's just so self-confident in whatever she's doing, but it's it's positive or negative. So she's just so confident she cannot cook. She just has never tried to cook. It's not even through experimentation. She just has yeah. never cooked other than like literally microwaving something for herself. She's never put a dish together. Um, so yeah. And so she thought, that's so interesting because she said, I've never really actually tried to cook. I just was so confident that I can't. But I just don't. <laughs> she had like a ingrained belief in her head. Like, yep, it's just a fact. Mm -hmm. It's a fact that mm -hmm. can't cook. Like mm -hmm. where it come from? I don't know. It's just a fact in my head. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so what a lot of people will term this as is stubbornness or strong-willed. Like if you hear you're stubborn or strong-willed, probably have a high sense of self-confidence. Yeah, somebody <laughs> used that means I guess my, with my wife tonight. <laughs> Since you said strong, what's the other one? Strong-willed and what's the other one? If, uh, strong-willed or stubbornness. Okay. If those words are used towards you, you have probably have a sense of high or high sense of self-confidence. <laughs> yeah, somebody use that. <laughs> Perfect. 
<laughs> You're gonna flip it around, right? Exactly. <laughs> Lonnie says I'm good because I have, I'm so, so stubborn. Right, that's right, right. See, that's a good trait. <laughs> um, so I would say that self confidence comes off as these are the doers. Like they just do the thing, right? Um, which is not surprising because you're you're very much that. Just just do the thing, right? <laughs> Have to do it. Done. Um, but okay. So the the interesting thing is rolling over into the fourth one, um, self um, self esteem. What there's a lot of confusion between these two, and it's because self esteem um, is not about doing. But people very much um, confuse self confidence and self esteem. So self confidence is that um, that um, well, I mean, it is a belief in the sense that you can is based on your ability, but not so much based on understanding what you're doing. I, I should say so. Like yeah. that's why I call them the doers. They're not so much always the thinkers, but they're the doers. Not that you can't do both. But in in of itself, the self confidence is really about the doers, not not the thinkers. Um, self efficacy is more about the thinkers. So, self esteem is just your internal sense of worth or value. And so, this one is the most elusive for people to really understand. Like, well, what do I do about it if I have a low self-esteem, sense of esteem, right? And then we constantly are hearing that, especially this past year, you know, and you, you, uh, I'm part of these parent, you know, Facebook groups and, you know, you hear parents just lamenting, like my, my, my child has such a low sense of self-esteem and um, now they've been disconnected from their friends or the friends that they did have. And now they're depressed and, you know, this whole scenario. And, um, and so what happens is because actions are seen as, as, um, a sense of high self-confidence, people actually mistaken this for a high sense of self-esteem. Because they see the actions and they're like, oh, you could totally do it. So yes. you must have a high sense of self-esteem where that's not necessarily true. Can it be true? Oh, totally. It could be true. But it's not necessarily true because um, we see these. That's why we see successful people fall. Um, they're successful in the sense that they're able to, to do some um they have some abilities that they're very strong in, and that's what makes them successful. But then you see, um, I especially think of celebrities, you know, the ones that um, get into drugs or have like just terrible personal relationships. It's because they really lack a sense of self-esteem. And what happens with people with high confidence but low self-esteem, which is, like I said, often those people you see in the spotlight who are, they're so successful. Why, why did they get into drugs? Or why do they have terrible relationships? Why, you know, and all of those types of questions. It's because when someone has high self-confidence, we don't question them. We just think, oh, like they have high self-confidence. They must feel really good about themselves. But that's really about the self-esteem. And so since nobody questions it, people actually don't know. Like, that's why people will be like, oh, my gosh, I was shocked. I was totally shocked that this person, you know, uh, took drugs or self-harmed themselves. And I just totally didn't see it. It's not so much that there wasn't probably any evidence. It's just you were seeing a person with high self-confidence. And so you create a filter to just see such great things in them. And you're not questioning them as to, like, hey, so... Was that a bummer when your I don't know when your movie didn't go well? You just think like, oh, they'll get through it. This has happened yeah. before, you know. Um, but that doesn't create, no matter how much of that tangible success, the external success doesn't contribute to their sense of self worth. So it's very much confused, but they are different, um, and so. Because self-esteem doesn't really have like a 
like defined qualifications, right? We, we don't have this like book, like this is high self-esteem. This is not high self-esteem because there's no qualifications. We can't, we can make up for like a feeling of self self-worth, right? We can't say like, okay, so Dr. Tony, if you see 50 patients this week, right? You, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to have low self-esteem by 60 patients <laughs> in the day. Well, okay. a week, either, like, I the job. <laughs> okay. So we'll say, Whew. what would be, what would be a good week for you? Like 260, 270, okay. 270, 270. All right. So Dr. Tony, if you hit, hit 200, and, we'll say 250, right? Just right yeah. below that. If you well, hit yeah, 250. Well, there's one guy that on here, uh, Dr. Roger Rose, he probably sees like 400 a week, but I'm not comparing to them because I have, I have good self-confidence and good self-esteem, Dr. Rose, and so <laughs> I'm going to say I'm not getting 260, 270. So. <laughs> there you go. And appreciate the hair comment, too. Yes, I do have good hair. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, so if I say, hey, Dr. Tony, no matter what, if you hit 250 uh, clients yeah. in, in a week, like you're just going to feel good automatically, right? Right? You have there so you go. self esteem. My self confidence is here. I have good self confidence, right? At that point, I, I, did, I, I did my job. Yeah. Right. But you could easily have, you know, someone else see 250 patients and be like, I did, but it doesn't make me feel like I'm worth anything. And then that's when the self talk of like, well, I could have seen. 50 more or 25 more or yeah, that was great. But um, I didn't See, serve my, this client the way they wanted to be served or, you know, any kind of yeah. interruption into that is really that lack of self-esteem. It might be, it might be like a, Hey, good for them too. They can see, see more people, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm good with that. It's almost, it almost, it's almost your next thought after, for example, there's that, I've got the movie what it was, but where he was a great singer and his girlfriend became a great singer too, but because of his lack of self-esteem, he was going to, he was coming out of the music industry, and all of a sudden he went into big drugs and he actually committed suicide. Mm. You know, so when that happens, like you go, okay, this is a good good singer, but who's the person behind the singer? Who's yeah. the personality? Like you see a lot on ESPN, you see a lot of thirty on thirties on ESPN where they talk about the person's background, how they went from being being on top of the world. All of a sudden, they dropped everything. They're on drugs or everything else too. Their whole life ended because, they're, they're, like you had mentioned, their self esteem wasn't there to maintain that self confidence the whole time. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and so the re so one of the things that I tell people is, if you have any sense of spirituality, and you have low self esteem, tap into that because because it's so undefined. Um, that's really where so many people who get into any sense of spirituality, um, they have a greater sense of control over their self-esteem because they understand that it's intangible, but because a lot of that self-worth comes from an outside entity, mm -hmm. um, that's where they're, they're gaining a lot of that sense of self-esteem rather than, you know, someone who doesn't have a sense of spirituality, um, they just have nothing else to give to them. They don't have a source to give into, you know, to to pour into them a sense of self worth. And so that's why a lot of times um, it's a lot more flexible and dynamic within people with spirituality. So if you find yourself low and you have a sense of spirituality, tap into that because that's really going to help you um, with your sense of self esteem. Um, so those are like faint four main components of self concept and they all work together and they're just different viewpoints of who you are. Um, and obviously the greater your scope and pictures of yourself, right? The more holistic, I guess you can live your life and, um, and to create the change that you want to create because you have all these components in place. Um, I think a lot of it is when we're talking about being a whole well-rounded person and having all those things lined up, is it something to, by having a coach that kind of walks through and kind of questions each one for you, at that point it kind of would 
make that process of getting all of those awareness concepts, the self-awareness concepts at a good level for that person because everyone's different, right? So some people are analytic, some people are creative, some people have different ways of looking at things. By having a coach, it, for me, would be okay. Having a coach, I've saved myself hours of therapy, hours of, for example, drug use. If I took drugs, I don't know. I don't do crack anymore, so I stopped doing crack a long time ago. But but can we do things that don't hurt or, or are self-destructive that or, or less efficient to make ourselves now in a very short period of time a better whole person and knowing how to get ourselves out of when we're in ruts. Definitely. How that help? Yeah, definitely. So that is really where um, ruts are typically because we don't know how to create that change. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's not within us. It's just somehow we have a mental block that makes it inaccessible to us. And so that's really where the coach comes in and starts to look and see what you're not utilizing within your own self to create that change that you want. Um, and a lot of times it comes down to the fact that we don't feel our feelings. And so this is why um, physical exercise really goes so strongly hand in hand with mental and physical health because People who are active and exercise regularly understand that discomfort is part of the journey. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but when you don't exercise regularly, a lot of times, and even how you were explaining, like people who are completely stressed out, they're more sensitive actually to mm -hmm external influences, even though another person may not find that painful, they do because they're already frazzled and they're already on heightened alert. So what happens is that people who don't have a sense of physical movement, that's very uncomfortable for them. And so when you might give them a set of exercises, right, and they're actually stretching, but they're seeing it as pain, Mm -hmm. rather than like flexibility, increasing flexibility. Um, whereas somebody who exercises regularly understands that, right? Understands what it means to stretch and what it means to increase flexibility rather creating than creating pain, like injury type pain. We can mm -hmm. differentiate that. And that just translates into life because if you understand that discomfort there's a sense of discomfort that is healthy and there's a sense of discomfort that is not healthy, mm -hmm. then mentally you're already prepared for the reality of life and its challenges. But when you're so heavily into avoiding discomfort and you actually, if you don't understand the difference between healthy and unhealthy discomfort, your, your primitive brain is always gonna be firing, you know, the fight or flight response and typically the flight response, you know? So that is really why physical movement is so, so important because emotions, right? We say emotions and feelings and we actually, some people have emotions, but it stays up in their head and it doesn't actually process through their bodies. And if you don't physically exercise, it's even more inaccessible to you because you don't understand what it means for something to be physically processed through you. Um, because when I get into a lot of the work with my clients, understanding emotions is really hard. I mean, it, even yeah. for me, like if you have to ask me what certain feelings feel like, it's a lot of work to understand simply like, what does actually grounded feel like to me? What does yeah. actually joy feel like? Like physically, what does it manifest in, in my body? And everyone's different. It took a lot of awareness. But once I was able to do that, like when I felt something like um, sadness, I could be like, okay, this is what sadness feels like. It's not going to kill me. I'm going to let it go through my body so that I could just feel it and I'm not holding it in and and holding this burden in my body, which is I'm sure what you deal with a lot, you know, 
you have clients who are stressed and it has to do a little, and it's not, stress has a lot of underneath it, anger, sadness, depression, all of it stresses your body out because it's being held in. And, and just because you are not processing it doesn't mean it's left your body. And so that's why physical exercise really helps people actually understand their emotions. So I say, that's why there's expressions like, oh my gosh, I was so nervous. I thought I was going to throw up because literally you have that feeling when you're super nervous, you feel like you're going to throw up or, you know, jumping for joy, right? Because literally that feeling causes your body to the way your neurons fire to manifest itself in like jumping for joy or dancing, however it comes out in your, in your, um, you know, personally, how it manifests in your body. But that's why also why it's exercise is also important. It actually taps you into your emotions and actually lets you feel your emotions. We call them feelings, but we don't always actually feel them. We just kind of have them at a, like a mental, like headspace, but we don't let them actually process through our bodies and they carry energy. Emotions can carry energy, right? That's why like people are like shaking with fear or anger, right? It's because it manifests in, in a very physical manner. Um, well, you mentioned so though too, with, with, with being in pain, working out, it's the same thing with emotions too. I'm assuming because being feeling emotional for some people is, is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. They're not used to that either. If they're in the headspace with an emotion all the time and they get uncomfortable with an emotion, same thing. Why would you want to feel emotional if it makes you feel uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. So by feeling little emotions here, like for what I do with my patients is I'll take them, if, if they're not comfortable stretching yet or if they're not a big stretcher, I'll take them to where I'll take them to a stretch where maybe a shoulder or a leg or a knee, whatever it is too, where I see their face change a little bit. Mm -hmm. I see your face go, ooh, they go, ooh, or ah, or mm -hmm. ah. And I'm like, oh, I see something, something again, they go, oh. I go, I go, that's the face I want you to make when you're uncomfortable. Because that's going to mm -hmm. remind you that it's okay for you to stretch this far. To feel this uncomfortable where you make a face, at that point you know it's still safe for you. Oh, that is it's so not mean. Causing pain. So I see the I said, hey, you made the face perfect. We're, we're, where we need to be for the stretch also. I love that. That they go, oh, I'm making the face. I'm, I'm having the, <laughs> the face emotion. That's the mindset of the emotion. But now my body's doing this. That's okay to do. So now I can relax through the stretch. Mm -hmm. I know that's safe for me. Mm -hmm. And feeling feeling like I can cry or something like that. I was watching whatever movie I was watching. You can cry. That's a safe emotion. Mm -hmm. That's that's a normal emotion to have versus I got to hold it, hold it, and hold it in. All of a sudden, you never really experience what it feels like to get through that emotion to feel the joy after the, after the tears, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that was, or it's a bunch of onions you had on the table that you've got left on the table. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that, that, is that, that makes sense though. That's, that's how yeah. I, I work with patients. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love that. That's, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's preparing their minds to understand, like you said, like it's discomfort, but that's actually healthy discomfort. And once you yeah. have pointed that out to them, then you're right, like they relax, which actually probably allows them to um, to get through their therapy even, even faster, more. Mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. they're relaxed. And also they're more willing to do it because now they know where the end point is and they know mm -hmm. that that discomfort is going to get them there. So I love that, that's amazing. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's exactly the physical way the mental way that I work with my clients is just the way that you physically explain that to your, your clients. So yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, yeah. And that's, that's really how you create that growth. Right. And just for you, how your clients um, increase their health and their recovery is exactly through those little bits of discomfort, <laughs> but prepping that's them the for the discomfort. So they know it's not, no, they know um, not to be fearful of like this kind of discomfort. Obviously, this kind, yes, is not the good well, kind. Once, it, it, once they've gotten to that discomfort, it's, it's it's their discomfort. They know what it is, and they can feel they know what it is. And what happens is that's no longer uncomfortable. Oh, it's sad. Now they have, now they find a higher <laughs> level of discomfort. Mm -hmm. It makes their upper mm -hmm. body even healthier because they're seeing results of that discomfort where they feel better. They feel less mm -hmm. pain. They feel more energy. They feel less stress, less anxious. Now their body can actually learn. Now they know they have that that loop 
of now if I do this where it's uncomfortable, my body feels better, my mind feels better, my overall life is better. So why why can't I become more uncomfortable to get more results out of that? You start you start, start I, for me. I start hearing them be more self confident that hey look this is working for me. What else can I do? Mm-hmm. What else can I do? When I hear the what else can when I what else I can do comment, I go perfect. I got them. Yeah. Now I got them and need to exercise to mm-hmm. feel better to make the overall body healthier and back to a normal healthy body mm-hmm. and mind also. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, that's work. amazing work that you do. <laughs> it's entertaining. It, it, it's fun for me. I don't know. It's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that growth. That's amazing. Yeah, I think that that's what you're talking about is how do we, how do we implement things that we can do physically to help our mind, but understand, like you had mentioned, all things we talked about it. I have, I just raised my notes. That's why I keep looking things down. All my notes, people. I take notes every time I do a talk, for the most part, all these, along with all the comments too that I put in there at different times to actually listen to these things. It allows you to understand what you're feeling, why you're feeling, or even not, even finding ways to not debate your primitive, your primitive brain to get, in my sense, I want to say not debate primitive brain, but how to be creative and at the same time, if need be, to make the results you want to make. Mm-hmm. In, a, in a short, efficient period of time, so it's right for you without stressing mm-hmm. yourself out, without making you feel uncomfortable, without making you feel a bad discomfort and feeling unsafe or in a dangerous spot, we become stressed. Yeah, and how you can Definitely. almost self—I want to say self, self-doctor, self-coach yourself once you've learned these different things, with how to deal with them. So your questions that you ask yourself are on point. What am I doing here? Why am I feeling some emotion? Well, it's because I'm doing this. Okay, that's good or is that bad? How to get out of here if it's bad or how to continue through this to get through it, to get the result I want. Mm-hmm. So I would assume with, with coaching, you get that result faster and faster and faster because mm-hmm. you're not asking these, you're not trying to trial and error things versus I know it, I know how to get through this and ask the right questions to myself. At that point, call my coach if I need to. At that point, get through this. So I, I'm on this side as soon as possible. Yeah, definitely. And you know, I love that ending part of what you're talking about because I had um, just thought of it the same way is that you um, you have set aside like a safe space for your clients in terms of like their physical limitations. Like, okay, you take it to here and you take it to here and you take it to here because really what that is is making decisions for them ahead of time because mm-hmm. if they don't know, they're going to be like, I mean, I just, I don't know how much discomfort, right? So I'm just not going to yeah. touch it. I don't want to injure myself, but you've already yeah. made that decision for them and helped them through that. Like when you tell them about the face, right? That's like, okay, mm-hmm. that's your, that's the key. And that's, you know, where your far end is like, great, you know? And so um, that's really what I do mentally with my clients is like, okay, mm-hmm. this is the, you know, some of the things to do, these are the discomforts that you're going to feel. It's totally normal. And instead of them being like, oh, it might be uncomfortable. I'm like, no, it's going to be uncomfortable. <laughs> like, it's don't, really like, that's not even a question, but this <laughs> is how much discomfort we go for. Um, and then, like you said, right, you, you start to learn to evaluate your own mindset and actions and results so that you can create your own process. And like you said, it, it gets better and better. And you, when we say up leveling, right, you, you just start to ask a whole nother set of questions because you've already addressed like these foundational questions that you have. You already know you can get these, maybe like these micro results, right? And now you start to go for bigger and bigger and bigger results. Um, and what really it does is talking about the primitive brain, when you have made all of these decisions ahead of time, like you said, for your clients, like when their face changes, that actually gives their primitive brain its safe space. Cause they're like, okay, all the way up to here is safe. And now, and because it knows ahead of time, now it feels safe. Because it's the unknown mm-hmm. that your primitive brain is afraid of. Because unknown means that I'm walking, I don't know, 
out in the open and a lion comes and rushes me or, you know, like that's like the unknown thing or like I'm going to another place and maybe it doesn't have food. Maybe it doesn't have water. Maybe yeah. you know, there's no shelter. Right. So this is the way our primitive brain works. But like you said, when you calm it down when you're like, okay, all the way up to here mm -hmm. is safe. And that's mindset wise how I work with my clients to be like, okay, these are the things that we're going to go through. This is where the discomfort's going like to be. You can lean into it until it feels like this. And then, mm -hmm. you know, that's your stopping point. And then you just keep um, going through that process and upping their game. And like you said, it might be more flexibility for my clients. It's the same thing. It's actually a flexibility of mindset and then seeing more mm -hmm. and more possibilities as to what their abilities can allow them to do. Um, and so like we were talking about, um, you know, people coming out of, we were talking about people wanting to maybe change their jobs or choose to stay mm -hmm. at home more. Well, when you have a flexible mind, you can actually see all mm -hmm. these possibilities. But when you have a fixed mind, you're like, okay, but I just, I have to go to this job and I have to commute two hours a day. Like there's just no other possibilities, right? When well, it's almost like you're like you're saying it is if, if I'm happy being discomfortable, uncomfortable here making the face here, and now that's my comfort level, I'm no longer making the face, I'm I enjoy the next uncomfortable thing. Mm -hmm. I want to go, okay, how far can I go with this mm -hmm. to another job if that's what it is, or mm -hmm. another work environment, or maybe Maybe working, maybe forcing. Hey, I got to work from home. If not, it's not going to work. Nothing. I find the job somewhere else. Where now you start pushing yourself to work. Not that's addictive, but how to get more comfortable. Maybe working out more. Maybe going. Maybe doing a half marathon and triathlon. Mm -hmm. Maybe now. Now next step for me is this versus and now I'm no longer uncomfortable. It gets boring. I call it being boring. That's a good <laughs> thing. How, now I'm in a healthier state. I'm boring. How do I make myself? How do I now? Now test my self almost that self-confidence to get the next result I want to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's just like you said, it's introducing them to the fact that mm -hmm. that discomfort is leading towards growth. And then it's almost like this marker and like this badge, right? <laughs> that we put on ourselves. <clears throat> like, you know, if you try a new workout and you're sore, you're like, hey, that's a badge of honor. Like I just, you know, I don't know, I upped or I tried new weights or I ran this mm -hmm. much farther or this much longer or I did this many more reps because it's like this badge of honor of like, oh, I'm up leveling myself. That pain, that discomfort is really that. It's, it's this discomfort of growth. And, um, and I guess that actually is almost like a semantics, like, you know, using your words, but like a pain of growth or discomfort of growth and a discomfort mm -hmm. of like pain, like mm -hmm. they're slightly different. And that's really where you come in and you really help your clients understand that from a very physical standpoint and mentally, like that's where I come in and like mentally trying to allow them to understand the difference between growth, discomfort and painful discomfort. Well, a lot of it is, is we talked about in our first talk too was, is I deal with people that, that have the mental, I call it the mental block of not able to see they can grow. That, that they actually, they feel like, Hey, I've, I've done this for so long. I have this. Is, and for me initially for our initial talk, I was like, well, I guess I can't help you. Good luck out there in the world. Right, right, right. <laughs> You're not in the right office, but right. something is, but is, is almost okay. Now, how do I take a step back and go, as as a health practitioner trying to help people is okay find, find out where that where is their mindset where were they lacking that that self-esteem that has allowed them to think this way and i'm not going to go and see what you what happened in your childhood blah 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 but mm -hmm. how do i make that next step with you to feel let's try something let's take two steps back to give you a little bit of taste of self self-confidence by having you complete this goal at that point does it change self-esteem if it does great if not Okay, how do we do one more and kind of see where see where this changes? And for me, it's their tone of voice, how they talk, their self talk, maybe negative or positive. So they get to that next step. Okay, how do I start building that self esteem in them by having these things, these results improve over time? And mm -hmm. sometimes for me, it's not even there how much they can stretch or exercise. Can can they sleep well? Mm -hmm. Has their pain level dropped enough? Are doing enough things at home where maybe they have they have mechanical or medical pain that now they're reducing where their sleep has improved. To sleep improves now they have more energy 
to mm -hmm. now do some exercising to feel now get themselves physically healthier. Yeah. yeah. What's what's the what's the what's the nervous system block while they're being so stressed that helps that even blocking their ability to sleep well? How do I reduce that to make themselves okay? Now now we can actually perform the exercise I want you to perform because because we had to deal with that first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I right now in my, in my head, I have three in my head right now I'm dealing with right now that are have dealt with pain for so long now that they can't sleep well. So how can they live a normal life if they're sleep deprived mm -hmm. every day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my that's my my uh, my the way I have learned from you, Lonnie, how to rethink when I'm dealing with patients to help them with that first level that may be beyond a, a mechanical or a physical level to get them to get to next to to actually get to that point. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Perfect for me. Thank well, you. I think your your work with your clients is amazing because that's such a holistic, and I know that's really where your heart is. Is always to treat your clients holistically, um, and that's why you offer all this value in really giving them so much empowerment and and education on like how to take care of themselves because. Um, the majority of the work is like outside of the time that they're with you. It's what you leave with mm -hmm. them once they leave the office, right? That, yeah. that, that 15 minutes of direction, but do they really carry it out through the next week before they see you again, or maybe a couple of weeks before they see you again, yeah. that's really where that, that the powerful work is. Um, so well, yeah, work where they can actually see the results of their life is better, not just when they're in the office. Right. I told, right. Him, I, told him, I can't go home with you. My wife would be upset. <laughs> Sometimes you may go, go, yeah, go with him, go with him, go, go. So <laughs> most she's like, yeah, you got to come home and take the trash out. I, mean, I don't know. That's something I do easy to do. But something to where, where I, I, I want to make sure you have enough tools. So you're your best doctor. You mm -hmm. are the patient to make sure they learn tools over time to keep themselves healthy. Yeah. Same thing with you do too. Is can you can you give the, these people these tools, your clients to keep themselves healthy? That point they know when they've dropped below what they can handle. Boom. That point. My my best patient ones that I only see maybe four or five times a year because they've kept themselves healthy. They've done the homework. That yeah. point they're coming just for a checkup. Hey, mm -hmm. I listen. To, I I built a wall this week and my back kills me. Yeah, come and see me. But if you're live if you're doing your normal life in normal stressors, that point you don't need me because now you've learned the tools how to stay healthy, you know, when your body is below what you can handle, you'll see me get you back here right away. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then that's, say, how, that's how you use it. Yeah. So the work is very minimal for you. And mm -hmm. then they just, the discomfort for them is so temporary yep. versus just kind of living in discomfort continuously. Yes. So I'm trying to avoid that. I'm too busy as it is. Wear myself out every day. No, no, Lonnie, I want to avoid that. And talk <laughs> about your workshop on the on the thirty first. Talk about your workshop on thirty first. Oh yes. So um, I'll I'll give you the link for it, but um, I'll I am running a workshop very much on the self concept um, idea. So if this is something um, that you'd like to learn more about or a tool that you'd kind of like to review again, um, Saturday, July thirty first at 9 a.m. It's just going to be an hour and a half. So 1030, you're done. You can still enjoy the rest of your Saturday, um, but have a new sense of self-awareness. And definitely if you have questions, this is a great time because I'm going to have questions ahead of time that I'm going to answer. And then also if you just come up with questions during the workshop, I can answer those too. Um, yeah, and I, I love connecting with people and really giving people these tools because they're so powerful once you understand how these tools work for you yourself. Um, so yeah, I'd love to have you come join me on that workshop. Good, good, good. I also put in the show notes link your your website also to contact you and also your Instagram. So you have they're gonna have that. And I want to thank uh, Joanne, Trevor, our, our friend, Trevor Ramos, um, him, along with my, my friend, Dr. Rosen, for his comments. And, and he has his own show. He does his own show. A lot of it is when we support ourselves, like like with the workshops and offering Q&A like that, it's, it's your time is, is, yes, 
it's time we're giving away to our patients, our clients, or just the community to make our overall communities better. I think yeah. being a healthcare educator, a healthcare professional, it's our duty to really educate our community. If there, and sometimes there is no direct positive ROI in mm-hmm. our pockets by that, but the karma, the goodwill allows mm-hmm. us to feel like, hey, I did something today. Besides yes. take the crash out, you know, everything else we have to do every day. But yeah, <laughs> Lonnie, thank you for being on the show today. It's a little bit longer than, 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 I, than uh, we usually have it. But I think the information people are going to get, especially when we do this to, as a podcast too down the line, it allows people a bigger picture of what it takes to get our body and our minds better. And it's, and it's not easy, but once you're there and you figure it out, with, especially with, if you want to make your life easy, do it with a coach. If not, good luck out there, my friends. <laughs> but at that point, you make your life easy with a coach. It allows you the freedom to realize when you're uncomfortable, it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. When you're struggling – Yes, it's a good thing because now we're going to become, we're going to grow. We're going to make mm-hmm. our bodies and our minds better and hope and not hopefully, but we'll see the result um, in our family and our professional lives. You'll mm-hmm. see the results there too. So at that point, kudos to you. All right. Yeah. This line, Kim, thank you for being on the show again. We appreciate that. I'm going to sign off and I'll, we'll talk a little bit more off the broadcast, but again, thank you guys for watching. Have a great day. Yeah. Have a great weekend, everyone.